precedence over you. May we run after you as our sole desire from this day on, Lord. May we speak through this time and really use this moment to just really speak and change and move in us, Lord. Thank you so much. We are ready. In Jesus' name. Remain standing. We have to do our morning tradition. Okay, it goes like this. Thank you, Lord, for such a beautiful day. Ready? Oh, thank you, Lord, for such. So this is the only song that I can play guitar and do the body motion at the same time. You might be wondering how is that possible? Watch this. No, don't can't make it up. No, I know this part. Thank you, Lord, for okay, so good. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for such a beautiful day. Sparkly hand. Come on, guys. Yeah. 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 guys in here. Sparkly hand. Jazz hand, actually. Jazz hand. Thank you, Lord, for such a beautiful day. It reminds me of the love you gave to me. You gotta look at each other and say, I want to reflect your love. And then you gotta do it to the people. That I need, shoulder to shoulder. Okay. And then we're going to repeat the same thing. Thank you for such a beautiful day. It reminds me of the love you gave to me. I want to reflect the love to the people that I need. No, 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 I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. It's not, it's not shoulder yet. It's the right over left hand. To the people that I need on today. If you hear things cracking, let go. Okay? And then, uh, every day is a gift from you, and you guys have to give each other a care gift. Okay? Every day is a gift from you, every day. You will help me start on you, and I know. Help me, Lord, to live this day for you. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Thank you, Lord, for such a beautiful day. It reminds me of the love you gave to me. I want to be such a love. Such a beautiful day. Ooh, it reminds me of the love you gave to me. I want to reflect your love to the people that I love. Not yet, not yet, one more time. Thank you, love, for such a beautiful day. Ooh, it reminds me of the love you gave to me. I want to reflect your love.
us up to Luke, uh, chapter 15. How many of you guys are excited for this afternoon? Yeah. 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 We're about to do something new here today. Look at your neighbor and tell them, get ready. Get ready.
that Jesus took away all our sins. Mm -hmm. That he called us to be worthy. Everyone say worthy. Worthy. Mm -hmm. So much to the point that he died on the cross for you and I. Yes. And so what I shared with him is this, that yes, Jesus, just like you and I, he accepts us and love us even though we are sinners. But he doesn't leave us as sinners. He purifies us from the inside out. Can I get an amen? amen? And so that was the real thing I said. But the real point of that story wasn't what I said. It was the fact that this guy got saved. Can I get an amen? amen. All right? That was the whole point of the story. And so if you guys got stumbled by that, then I, I ask for your forgiveness. All right? But uh, today, today, I want you guys to look at your neighbor right now and ask them this question. Ask them, what am I worth? So that you can 
get me this necklace. So then I could win Chelsea's heart. Right? So, yeah. I, so I worked hard, worked diligent. Man, so many guys are already. You guys are really must be good. Anyways, but <laughs> You guys need loving, that's all. Amen. So I, I eventually got this necklace, and I eventually got this necklace. But the next time I saw Chelsea in the hallway, I was so scared to give it to her. So I did what any brother would do. I gave it to my younger brother. I was like, you give it, all right? He's like, you give it. Chickened out. I didn't think anything else of this. But guess what happens? After school, I go to the front of the school. And usually my brother is there. And we usually go home together. But guess who's there? Chelsea is there. I kid you not. Chelsea is waiting for me. And the moment I step out, what ends up happening is Chelsea comes running to me with her hair. All right? She comes running at me. And you know what she does? She gives me the biggest hug. James, thank you so much for this necklace. I could not have even imagined that you, you could get me this. But you know what? We've been such good friends. Oh. Oh. I, I want to ask, can we just continue on being friends? Oh. Oh. James lost his chance. No, Chelsea lost her chance. Oh. What makes rejection so hard is not the fact that you go through the rejection, but it's this lingering feeling afterwards of not feeling worthy. See, when we look at ourselves and we ask, what am I worth? We'll get all types of answers. Some of us, your friends will look at you and ask, what am I worth? They'll be like, oh, you know what? You're nice. And you have a nice character. All right, you're funny. Okay? Uh, or if not, you, if not you're funny, you look funny. And so because of that, <laughs> you're worthy to be called my friend. And, and it's even like this on social media, right? Like, for example, if you have one follower, you're not worthy to follow. But if you have like 100,000 followers, yeah, all right? I would, you're, you're worthy to follow. In this world, that's what it looks like. And regardless of who you ask what I am worth, one thing is clear that when it comes to our worth in this world, we have to prove our worth. We have to prove to one another. We have to prove to each other our value and our worth. And even our parents, I'm going there. Even our parents believe that we have to prove our worth. And the greatest example in how we have to prove our worth is through our grades. All right? How many of you guys ever had this experience that, you know what, that your parents won't say this, but they, 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 they imply this, that, you know what, son, you better get an A. Oh, so you're not worthy to be called. And, and you know what the thing is? You know what makes, all right, he's gone, all right? So what, what, you know what, what parents do worse is this. It's not the fact that, even though they don't say it, they show it. How? by comparing our grades oh. with someone else's grades. Oh. All right? I remember growing up, my, my dad would be like this. How come you can't be like Grace across the street? You know, she gets straight A's, honor roll, student. And this was when I was in high school, right? And you know, she gets all these amazing grades. 
And I'm looking at my dad, I'm like, Dad, Grace is in fifth grade. I'm in high school, right? <laughs> How can you compare? What the thing is this? The pop bottom line is this, that in this world, we have to prove, everyone say prove. Prove. Our words. We have to prove our words. And because we operate in this world, we feel like many times we have to prove our words even to God. We have to prove that you know what, that we have to work our way to come to God. But if you know anything about Jesus when it comes to this understanding of words, it's not like anything that you've heard of. In fact, okay, I want to encourage you guys. If you guys are falling asleep during my message, you have every permission to stand up. Okay, um, Stand up. Go on the balcony. Uh, and fall asleep so that you can fall. No, I'm <laughs> no, I'm joking. I love you. I just want you guys to stay awake because this is life or death. Anyways, it's the word of God. Amen. 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 But going back to the message, all right. But I'm for real. If you guys are tired, uh, you know, get up. All right. Uh, uh, share this message standing up. We'll do whatever it takes uh, because it's. I really believe it's it's important. Uh, but when it comes to Jesus, when he talks about our worth. He doesn't talk about it in any standard of this world. In fact, uh, if you were with Jesus and you went to church uh, and you heard what Jesus talks about when it comes to, to worthiness and being called worthy, you, you, you would, you would kind of get frustrated with Jesus because Jesus in the Bible would always befriend people that are not really worthy to be called friends. In fact, you would think that, oh, you know, Jesus is so sweet because he would befriend people that are, you know, down on their luck, that are bullied, that are abused. But actually, believe it or not, the people that Jesus befriends are the ones that are doing the abusing, are the ones that are, you know what, uh, bullying, are the ones that are causing the problems during that time. I mean, he would befriend tax collectors. All right? Who would steal from others. He would befriend prostitutes. He would befriend sinners. In fact, he was known to be a friend of sinners. And he would make the religious leaders and the people that diligently go to church to prove their worth before God by going to church, by doing all these great things. He would try to, uh, he, he would make them feel so uneasy. Because everything that he preaches and everything that he does Go up, goes opposite to everyone that operates in the world. And not only are the religious leaders mad, because Jesus, the reason why he would, they would be so mad is not only because he would befriend these people, but he would reward these people. He would reward, and not only that, in the middle of his message, he would show how these people in the world that says that they are not worthy, that they are rejects, that they, 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 they should be loved, he would, he would say how, how great and amazing they are through his stories. He would share about parables. Everyone say parables. parables. You know what parables are? Parables are none other than stories. How many of you guys love stories? All right. How many guys love the story I shared in the beginning? Yeah. I have tons more stories to share, right? But here's the thing. In his stories, he would talk about parables, stories. And in stories, there, in stories, there are deeper meaning. Everyone say deeper meaning. Deeper meaning. And so in, in today's passage, before we get to today's passage story, there were two other parables that he shares. He shares a parable about a shepherd. A, a shepherd who had a hundred sheep. All right? It's like in today's modern language, all right? It's like, all right, if you, I mean, we don't have sheep, but, you know, and we may not love sheep, but we love puppies, right? Okay, so we, it's, oh, ladies are like, oh, I love puppies too, all right? But the thing is this, all right, that's the equivalent. It's, and, and it talks about in this passage how a shepherd would have a hundred sheep, but one of them goes astray. One of them gets lost. And it, that one sheep would wander. And the thing is this. All right, if you were a shepherd, and if you had a hundred sheep, and you would lose one, yeah, you know, it kind of sucks, but you would stick with the 99. Why? Because in your eyes, what's more in your eyes? 99 or the one? 99. 99. 
good. You're Asians, all right? You guys know that. <laughs> but here's the thing. He leaves the 99. The shepherd would leave the 99 and would go after the one. He would leave the, 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 the security of the 99 and go after the one. And, and I don't know about you, but here's the thing. 99 is more than one. What's more worthy is the 99 over the one. And to be honest, that one deserves to be lost. Why? Because that one was dumb. <laughs> it was a dumb sheep that did not decide to stay but decided to go. But here's the thing. Jesus mentions how the shepherd would love that one and value that one. And you know, the thing is, this, it doesn't make sense. And what doesn't make more sense is the next story. He talks about how this woman had 10 coins, 10 lost coins, and she realized one of them is missing. And you would think that, you know what, yeah, it sucks the fact that I lost that one, but at least I have nine. But guess what this woman does? She flips out. Ah, all right, where's my one coin? Where's my one coin? Where's my one coin? And, and she goes crazy and forget the nine. She already lost the nine, all right? She flips tables, she flips chairs, all to find the one. Now, the thing is this, all right? These stories don't make sense. And you're not like, oh, these are great parables. No, they're not. They don't make sense, all right? They're, like, when it comes to worth, when it comes to this understanding, it, uh, it, it makes no sense at all. And then we come to today's story, which makes the most illogical sense of being worthy, being found worthy. See, in Luke chapter 15, it says this, that a father raises two boys. How many boys? Two. two. All right? Kind of sounds like my story with me and my brother. But yeah, my brother gets everything and I get nothing. Anyways, but the, two, the father raises two boys. And one of them says he wants to move away. The younger one says, Father, I want to move away. But as I move away, I no longer want to recognize you as my dad. Okay? In fact, I want to ask you, can you give me what, whatever leftover money, my, can you give me my inheritance? You know what that's the equivalent of saying? That's the equivalent of saying, Dad, I wish you were dead so that I could have the money that you were going to leave off after you die. I mean, imagine if you ever say that to your dad. You know, if, if I said that to my dad, you know, if I were to say, Appa, Appa, Dad, I wish you were dead. <laughs> So give me the keys to your car. You know what my dad would do? He would be like, you know the movie 300? All right? He will be like the Spartan. He will be like, this is Abba, get out! All right? And kick me out of the house. And the thing is this, but not this father. You know what he does? He gives his son what he wants. He gives his inheritance. And, and it goes on talking about how he goes off partying and living the life until it's all gone. And he finds himself in this passage that we read today, eating from a pig's pen. He's eating from a pig, and he realized that his father's servants ate so much better. And so he even realizes, you know what, I cannot go back as my father's son, because according to that standard, according to the world's standard, that I'm no longer worthy to be called my father's son. And so I'm going to go back as a servant. I'm no longer worthy. Everyone say worthy. worthy. He says, I'm no longer worthy to be a son anymore. But instead, I'm going to be a servant. And see, this younger, bro this younger brother is preparing a speech to go back to his father, to go back home. But something crazy happens as he returns. He sees his father waiting for him. And he's waiting for the longest time. And the moment this father sees his son, he runs towards his son. And during that time, fathers, older men, would never run. You would never see older men run. But the only time that they would run was in the time of war. And so if you could imagine this father, if you were the younger brother, and you see this father running to you, you know what you're thinking? Oh my gosh, my dad's going to kill me, all right? He is about to go to war, and he wants to destroy me. But we see the story goes that as he is running towards this younger son, you know what he does? The father embraces the younger son. And he doesn't understand. The younger son is perplexed because in his mind, he's like, no, 
I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy to be called a son. And so he prepares his speech. And whatever prepare, preparation his speech, he says this in verse 20. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven, against you. I am no longer worthy. Say worthy one more time. Worthy. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And you know how the father responds? He ignores whatever excuse the son is making. He doesn't acknowledge it. And you know how the father responds to this unworthy son? With goodness. With love. With compassion. It says this in verse 22, but the father said to his servant, quick, bring the rest, best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. See, if the story ended here, it would be amazing. But there's a little portion after the story that many people don't talk about. Because as much as there is the younger brother, there is an older brother as well in this story. And here's what it says about the older brother. Verse 28. If you're all there, can you give me a moment? Amen. Amen. It says this. And the older brother became what? Amen. He was upset. And he refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. Verse 30, but when this son of yours, who, was, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? This is how the father responds. He says this, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. It's great that the father said what he said, but believe it or not, the story is incomplete. Because you know why? We never knew, we never know what happens to the older brother. The older brother is never mentioned. And the sad truth about this story is that we will never know what happened to this older brother. But I believe this, that there is another story. And in order for me to explain the story, all right, I'm gonna do, you guys, you guys ever watched the movie Inception? I'm going to share a story within a story. And the story is concerning about two other brothers. See, I, there was these two brothers. They were orphans, okay? Meaning that they didn't know who their parents were. They grew up in the orphanage. And what ended up happening was, as they were growing up in this orphanage, um, there was an older brother and there was a younger brother. And in this orphanage, uh, they had the orphans started attending Sunday school. So they started attending church on Sundays. And the older brother, as he would observe, he would observe the people worshiping, being joyful, you know, being, being, being happy. And, you know, and there was a celebration and, and, and people uh, were experiencing this love. And he, he, the older brother was loving, loving church more and more. But the younger brother, he wasn't happy. And as you see, as they keep on going to church, the older brother starts loving to go to church more and more and more. And the younger brother, he is totally disengaged with church. And so the older brother notices this and he asks the younger brother, he says this, he says, bro, why do you not want to go to church? Why? And he's like, because I don't believe in God. He's like, why don't you believe in God? You know, he, he calls us to be his worthy sons. And he says this, if God was a true loving God, then why would he make us orphans? Why would he allow us to grow up in this environment? Why would he allow us to live this life that's unworthy to live? And so the brother did not know what to say. 
And so they grew up, and eventually they grew up out of this orphanage. And they found a place for themselves. And in this place for themselves, the older brother kept on going to church. He would wear his Sunday suit, and he would go to church with his Bible. And he would go to church, and, you know, when, uh, and as he was going to church, we see the younger brother drifting away from the church and going to the world. Partying, doing whatever he wants. And all the brother, older brother could do was just pray and wait. Until one night, what ended up happening was this. There was something that happened that changed everything. One night, the brother was sleeping. And as he was sleeping in the dark, he noticed when he woke up that there was someone in the room. Okay? Aren't you glad I'm not sharing this at night? <laughs> so, he noticed that there was someone in the room. He didn't know who it was. But from, he noticed that as much as there was this person in the room, there was this funny smell coming from, the, from this. And the only thing he heard in the pitch dark was this, bro, and he knew immediately it was the younger brother. The older brother turns on the light, and on the clothes of the younger brother was full of blood. And the younger brother looked at the older brother and said, bro, I did something wrong. I'm so sorry, I, I don't know what to do. And in the background, the older brother hears a mob coming to look for the younger they're at the gate, slamming the gate. It's like, we're no, we know you're in there. We know you're in there. You better come out. We know what you did. You better come out. And they're slamming the gate open. And the older brother, not knowing what to do, he ends up taking the clothes off, the bloodstained clothes off the younger brother. He says, take it off. He, he, he rips it off of him. He takes it off of him, button by button. And he takes off his pants. He's, and, he, and he tells the brother, he's like, stay in this closet. He, he hides him in the closet. He says, no matter what, I don't want you to come out of this. And he closes the closet door, and now this mob is at the door, slamming, kicking the door, saying, you better open it, we know you're in there. You better open this door right now. And the bro older brother, you know what he ends up doing? He ends up taking the bloodstained clothes and he starts putting it on, button by button by button. And by the last button, the mob comes in. You know what they start doing? They start beating the older brother. They start beating him. Say, you know what you did? You, you are the worst person in the world. According to what you did, you don't deserve to live. And they started beating him left and right, left and right. Not knowing where the punches were coming. He was just taking it. He was just eating it. And eventually the, the police came and stopped everything. And what eventually happened was this, that uh, obviously uh, uh, there was this heinous crime that was committed. And they went to trial for it. And there were witnesses that witnessed uh, uh, this, this, this brother who they didn't even see correctly, but they said, you know what, it's that person. Oh yeah, it's that person. He did this. And the crime was so heinous. And, they, and all these people were making accusations against this older brother. And they said, you know what, it was him that did it. He deserves the penalty. And the judge looks at the, uh, the older brother and he says this, do you have anything to say for yourself? And the only thing he said was this, here to pay a price. And so whatever the price is, I'm willing to pay. Give me whatever you got. And the judge sentenced him to death. He says, you're going to die because you don't deserve to live. And so in jail, what happens is this, that he's in prison. But the, in prison, there was, a, there was a warden in that prison, the, the top leader. And he noticed that when he looked at this older brother, that he was different from any other prisoners. This, this, this older brother, all he did was he worshiped God. He would cry out to the Lord. He would pray. He wouldn't know who he's praying for, but he's praying for someone in his jail cell. And on the, la on the week of the execution, what ended up happening was this. He asked, this, he asked the older brother, he said, is there... Any last wishes you have? Is there any last food you want to eat? He's like, I don't really care about that. What's your last wish? He said, I have this one letter with this address. Can you please send this letter to whoever, I mean, to whatever the address is? And so the warden's like, okay. And that week, the older brother really dies. And so the warden sees this letter, and instead of giving it himself, he ends up sending one of his servants. He said, you know what, take this, take this letter, and, and go. And so this person is trying to find, this messenger is trying to find this address, but he can't find it. 
until he sees this old, abandoned, shabby-looking place that, you know, it doesn't even look like it's worth living in. Goes in to see if there's anyone in it. And guess what happens? As he's going in, do you know who he finds there? He finds this, this person that was there, smells, beard. And guess who it was? It was the younger brother. This messenger got so freaked out, he just threw the letter and ran out the door. And this younger brother, looking at the letter, realized, oh my gosh, it's my brother. Opens the letter. And you know what the first letter says? It says this. Bro, bro, I love you, and I want to let you know. I'm wearing your clothes. I'm wearing your clothes to die for you. He, he couldn't wrap his mind around that. He couldn't understand. He's like, no, 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 no. He don't deserve that. Listen, I deserve. I, if anything, I deserve to die. I don't deserve to live. My, my brother, he didn't do anything. And he runs out the door. He goes to the prison where, where the brother was being held. He slams the door, he slams the gate, and he's a madman. And he said, like, you, you, you guys got it wrong. This is wrong, this is wrong. I made a mistake. And the warden ends up coming out. He's like, who are you? And he's speaking all this gibberish. He's trying to explain. He's like, you got the wrong person. You, 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 no, 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 no. You got the wrong person, you know what? And, and sooner or later, the warden realizes who it was. And he realizes that, you know what, the real person that needed to die was, was this guy. And he got so upset that he grabbed this younger brother by the shirt and he says, get the heck out of here. The price is already paid. Don't ever show your face here ever again. They close the gate and this brother, he is in tears. He doesn't know what to do. And he ends up wandering back home. And at that time, when they had funerals, what they would do is they would find the, the possession of whatever the older brother would have and burn it. But all he had was a Sunday suit and a Bible and a pair of shoes that he would go to church with. And he started crying. He did not know what to do. But then he noticed that he flipped only one side of the paper, but he didn't see the other side of the paper, the bottom side. And so he looked back at the letter, and this is what the letter was. He says, brother, I love you, and I'm wearing your clothes to die for you. But it continues on, and he says this. He says, I'm wearing your clothes to die for you, but now you wear my clothes, and you live like me. Brothers and sisters, you know why I'm sharing you guys this story? Because the true older brother we are all looking for is none other than the Lord Jesus. See, today I want to let us know that this older brother, that even though the older brother's story ends there, we need to understand that Jesus, the Bible says this, that when Jesus was came to this earth, the Bible says this, that God sent his only son, Jesus Christ. He was the one brother who was more worthy than the older brother of the prodigal story. Jesus was more worthy because in the Father's eye, he had no sin. There was nothing that he did wrong. He lived a perfect life. He lived a life completely following the will of the Father. But when he died, he died a sinner's death. Why? Because he took our sin. He took our shame. He wore our clothes that were stained with sin and shame, and he put it on us. And afterwards, what ended up happening was this, that he died, and he rose again after three days. And the reason why he had to rise again after three days was to let you and I know that even though you don't know God as a father, even though you feel like you're far from him, that you know what, as long as you believe that I made a way, then you are called worthy. Everyone say worthy. Worthy to be called a child of God. And you know how he tells us to wear his clothes? He says, listen, 
from now on, you wear my clothes. How? By obeying my words. And by clothing yourself with my spirit. You know what was so amazing about the end of the story of the younger brother? He ends up going to church. And after church, he ends up coming out. And he sees his old friends. And they're like, hey, bro. Hey, sorry we weren't there for you. You needed us. But hey, we had some good times. Why don't you come back? Why don't you join us back in the world? And they grabbed him by, the, by his Sunday suit. And knowing the clothes that he was wearing, he told his friends, the person that owns the suit will never follow you. The person that wears the suit has a greater worth in this world than anything else. What Jesus is trying to show us in this final parable is how we see ourselves. That I am not worthy to be called a son because I haven't achieved this or I haven't mastered this or, you know, I've fallen into this many sins. But brothers and sisters, you know why you're called worthy? You're called worthy because Jesus died for you. Amen. He set us free here today. Amen. Some of you tonight are busy preparing a comeback speech, but I want to tell you guys this, that you don't have to worry about what you're going to say because you know why? The Father is already He's saying, listen, if you accept my son, if you're clothed with humility, if you know that, you know what, that you've already repented of whatever you've done and accepted my son, then guess what? You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. I'm going to ask Tracy to come up real quick.
find myself unworthy. But Jesus, I thank you for coming after me, for dying on the cross for me, for taking my sin, for taking my shame, and going on the cross. And I thank you Secret. 
yeah, if that's something that's, wait, you are hurting something. Well, mostly, all right, but, or if not. Uh, but, but the whole idea is this. We are gonna activate ourselves by declaring God's truth, amen? God's truth over ourselves. And so here's the thing. You're gonna, on the left, write down all, list out all the lies that were told on your life. And on the right, list out all the truths, okay? So let's do that right now, okay? And so, yeah. Do you guys want background music? I don't know, because it gets more spiritual, right? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Let's give a round of applause here. All right, so as you guys are doing this, I want you guys, yes, list out the lies, all right? And it could be as long as you want, all right? It could be as long as you want, all right? Uh, list out those lies. And on the right, I want you guys short truth, okay? So the lies can be this, all right? Um, uh, Chelsea wanted to be a friend. Uh, the truth is, I'm a friend of God. All right, all right, all right, calm down, calm down, all right? I'm supposed to be serious, okay? But the thing is, all right, or, or it could be this, I am not loved. I am loved by God. You know, I, uh, I fall short. You know, I am worthy, okay? Uh, things like that, all right? So whatever it is, just list it out. On your left are lies, on your truth are the truth. And I want you guys to really pray about it. If, you can, if it's hard for you guys to like know the truth behind it, I, I, I want you guys to pray about it and ask the Lord, God, what is the truth that you have to say about this law? And, and I believe God is going to give you words to write. Struggling uh, doing this um, by the show of hands. Is anyone struggling right now? Okay. Uh, or for those, for those of you guys, I want you guys to meet me on the side. All right, so I can better, better explain. So if you're having trouble, I'm going to be on the side over here. But for the rest of you guys, I, I noticed that there's a good number of you guys that are writing. I want you guys to continue writing, and I want you guys to continue. Yeah. So, but for those of you guys that are having trouble, just come meet me, and uh, we'll, we'll work it out together.
as you guys are writing out the lies and the truth, I want to encourage you guys, as you guys are finding out these truths, I want you guys to also at the same time cross out those lies. Because that's not who you are. When you get a truth behind those lies, cross it out. All right, by the show of hand, how many of you guys need more time? Okay. By the show of hand, how many of you guys are done? Okay. Uh, 50, 50. Okay. We'll wait a couple more minutes, and then we'll paint. Who needs more time? By the show of hands, if you need more time, raise your hand. Okay, good. All right, everyone look up. Okay, you cross out all the lies. All right, now I only want you guys to see the truth. Okay? Because this is what we're going to do right now. We are going to activate ourselves by declaring these truths out loud in our groups. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to form two circles, all right? The ladies are going to meet here, and the guys are going to meet here. In the middle of the circle, there is going to be a chair. And on this chair, every single person in this room is going to go up. One at a time. One at a time. <laughs> and we're going to declare this truth. And as we declare this truth over ourselves, guess everyone in that circle you know what we're going to do? We're going to cheer that person off. Yeah. Woo! And here's why this is important. Because you know what we need more in this generation? We need more courage. And what's courage? Courage. We need more courage to speak truth in a world full of lies. But courage requires encouragement. And us clapping and us doing that, you know what we're doing? We're encouraging that individual by placing our courage in that individual and saying, hey, speak that truth. We believe that truth. And let me tell you, I believe this, that when we are able to celebrate one another, that our Lord is going to see us and he's going to celebrate with us. Can I get an amen? Amen. 
I believe this, that this activity is by far, and I wanna encourage you guys, whatever you guys did right now, do it on a weekly basis. If there is, because the thing is this, the enemy, he, yeah, you guys are realizing the truth right now, but you know what? Next week, it's another battle. Week after that, it's another battle. But this is the activity that we're gonna do together in order to release that. And so, and my hope is this, my hope and belief is this, if we can learn as a church to speak truth over ourselves, I believe this, by the time we go back to school, we can speak truth over everyone around us. Okay. So this is that worthy activation. And I'm praying that God will move in, in a mighty way. And so let me pray real quick. And so ladies on this side, and guys on this side, and every one of us. And here's the thing, I'll, I'll tell you this. I, I still remember, I still remember we did this as in my church, and it was so awkward in the beginning. It's like, oh my gosh, like I can't believe I'm doing this. But let me tell you, the more people cheer on, the more it's cheered. And I don't want you guys to stop. I want you guys to clap so hard that even the retreat side people are like, what's going on in there, right? What is, and what's going on? It's a Holy Spirit party, amen? amen. And so, ain't no party like a Holy Spirit party, because the Holy Spirit party goes, Stop. Stop. That's right. Yeah. 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 It never stops. And so we're going to celebrate with the Holy Spirit over that individual. And I, I believe this, that, you know what, it's, it's going to be a powerful. And I still remember in our retreat, going back to the story about retreat, my retreat, when we did this, I remember there was one group that finished, but the ladies didn't finish, all right? Because, you know, ladies, they are more in touch with, you know, their identity and their work, and so they have so much to share. And so you know what the brothers end up doing? They're like, hey, Let's go and cheer on the sisters. We started cheering on, and I still remember everyone went besides this one person, and it happened to be our worship leader. And that worship leader is like, "Wait, I didn't go." And as she was doing it, they were cheering her name. Zero, zero, zero. And no pressure. You don't have to do it like that. But the thing is this. <laughs> But I believe this, that we're going to have our own amazing time, amen? amen. Yeah. Right. So let me pray real quick, and then I'm going to release you guys, and we're just going to, we're just going to rock this house, all right? So I pray, Spirit of God, won't you explode in this room right now in Jesus' name? Lord, I pray and I believe, oh God, that the moment we declare this truth, that whatever lies that the enemy has thrown at us, of making us feeling unworthy to be called children of God. Father, that they will all be broken right now in Jesus' name. Lord, as we declare your truth, I pray that this truth will set us free. Lord, that this truth will break off every shame, every guilt, every lies of the enemy. And Lord, I pray that, Lord, as we continue to celebrate each other, Lord, I pray that, Lord, that there will be a spirit of breakthrough. Lord, that there will be such a crazy move of God, Lord, in this activity. And Lord, I pray that we will never stop, Lord, cheering. We will never stop celebrating over the truth that you have spoken over your children this day. And so we pray for courage. We pray for strength. We pray for encouragement through the power of your spirit. And we pray all these things in the mighty, precious name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.